Hello, my name is Jeff Messier. I'm a professor in electrical and software engineering in the Schulich School of Engineering. And in this lecture, I'm going to talk about how we design computer memory. And this lecture has a lot of information in it. It's one of the longer ones. I'm going to start out by just talking at a very high level what we mean by, by volatile computer memory, non-volatile computer memory. Then I'm going to present a functional block for the data memory that is used by the AVR microcontroller. And then we're going to talk a little bit about how you design a very basic digital logic circuit to store a single bit. And then we're going to use these cells, these single bit cells, to construct our functional AVR data memory block. Now, one of the things I should mention, like starting in this module and going forward, we are going to be developing a digital design for the AVR microcontroller. This digital design is not meant to represent exactly how the chip is designed by the manufacturer. I'm sure there's going to there would be lots of differences. It's it would work. It's I'm going to present something that can execute certain AVR machine language uh, instructions. However, it's meant mainly as a teaching tool, mainly as a conceptual tool, mainly showing you how you might design a microarchitecture. And again, it's not necessarily meant to represent how um, the chip is, is actually designed. So with that disclaimer, let's let's dive in and start talking about memory first at a high level. Volatile memory is memory that loses its data when it's power cycled, when you turn the power off, basically. And random access memory or RAM is the primary type of volatile memory. And dynamic, there's, there's two large families of RAM, dynamic RAM and static RAM. Um, so dynamic RAM or DRAM is the kind of, so when you buy RAM for your computer, um, it's typically DRAM. So um, DRAM stores bits as charge on a capacitor. And the reason why DRAM is designed this way because, is because it allows for very, very high density. Um, the reason why it's called dynamic, though, is that um, bits, the bits on, it, stored in DRAM disappear when you read them. So basically, you um, charge up a capacitor to represent a one, but when you read that capacitor, the charge flows off the capacitor and um, the memory disappears. So as you can imagine, it's kind of complicated to design the circuits to sort of um, make DRAM work, but I mean, people do it. And there's a bunch of different sort of terminology around DRAM. Synchronous DRAM or single data rate DRAM performs one performs a read and a write in sync with the, um, the CPU clock. And synchronous memory is the kind of memory we're going to explore in detail once we get into memory design. Um, double data rate SD RAM, which is, um, or DDR SD RAM for short, uh, performs two read and write operations per CPU clock cycle. So as of the time of recording for this, this video, if you um, go to a computer store and buy RAM for your computer, it will be some generation of DDR SD RAM. The other type of volatile memory is static RAM or SRAM. And static RAM stores bits using what's basically equivalent to a cross-coupled inverter. And I'm going to show you that circuit a little bit later on in, in this module. Um, it turns out that static RAM is actually faster than um, DRAM, but it's less dense. And so you can't have a huge amount of storage with static RAM, but because it's so quick, it tends to be used for high performance memories that are close um, and sometimes inside the CPU. So later on in this course, we're going to talk about things like caches and caches tend to be um, static RAM. Also, the memory inside the AVR microcontroller, the data memory, is static RAM as well. Non-volatile memory, as the name suggests, is memory that rem 
is able to retain its data even after being powered off. And the classic example of non-volatile memory uh, is hard drives, the hard drives for computers. And in the past, kind of up until present day, the primary technology for hard drives has been um, magnetic, spinning magnetic plates. So ones and zeros are stored on spinning magnetic plates within the hard drive structure where ones and zeros are stored um, by uh, magnetically polarizing the plates in one way or, or another. Um, however, this is changing and, you know, arguably right now, if not right now in the, in the near future, uh, flash memory is going to take over as the primary non-volatile memory technology for, for computers. And flash memory is basically a, a transistor-based memory where uh, memory is stored, you know, using transistors rather than spin spinning magnetic disks. Um, flash is, if you're a gamer, you know this, it's much faster than um, a regular magnetic hard drive. It's quieter, it's more energy efficient as well. And so for all these reasons, it's really coming on as, as the dominant memory technology. There are some disadvantages of flash, interestingly, well, it's more expensive, um, and interestingly, slightly less secure because when you delete something from flash, um, you can actually read it again in, in some cases, like, you know, deleting can actually, deleted memory can actually be recovered just due to the nature of the technology. Um, but really those, you know, the cost is coming down, the security issues can be dealt with. And so going forward, flash memory really will be the primary um, non-volatile technology. And flash is what's used inside the AVR microcontroller to store um, or for instruction memory, basically. I'm not going to get into like the sort of the transistor or logic level design of flash memory in a lot of detail in this class, but it's worth Googling if you're, if you're curious about it. So in this module, we're going to design a, well, technically we're gonna design two functional memory blocks, the instruction memory and the data memory. Um, really, we're basically gonna focus primarily on the data memory block, but the instruction memory block is a lot simpler and you can, I'm sure by the end of this module, we'll be able to see how we could just simplify the data memory to create an instruction memory as well. So just to, um, to start off with discussing the inputs and the outputs of these block, blocks, um, instruction memory takes a 16-bit address, and based on that 16-bit address, outs bit, outputs a 16-bit memory word. Data me and the instruction memory block is read-only. Now, when we actually work with the AVR microcontroller in our hands-on exercises, we will be programming instruction memory. So instruction memory on the AVR devices is flash memory and using the uh, PickKit programmer, we will be programming, uh, writing our own instructions into the flash memory. But for the purposes of our discussions in the lectures, we can assume that instruction memory is read only. And data memory allows reading and writing. And so let's talk about the data memory first in a little bit more detail. So data memory takes a 16-bit address uh, or uses 16-bit addressing. So as one input, we have a 16-bit address bus that indexes the regions of memory. Um, data memory on the AVR chip uses byte level addressing and is divided into 8-bit words. And that means that the 16 address bit bits index a particular byte in, in data memory. And the byte that we index with our address appears on the read bus. And because we have 8-bit words, the width of the read bus is 8 bits. Data memory also allows for writing um, values as well. And so if we want to write a particular byte into 
data memory. We put the value that we want to write into data memory on the WD bus, the write bus. And let's clean this up a little bit. And we set write enable equal to one. Once write enable is equal to one, on the next rising edge of our clock, the value on the WD bus is written to the location in memory specified by the address bus. So the address bus is using for both reading and writing. Uh, just to, to emphasize what I, what I just said, writing uses the clock input. So write only, a write only occurs on the rising edge of our clock input. However, reading is using, uses a, a combinational logic design rather than a synchronous logic design. And the value on the read bus changes immediately as soon as the value on the address bus is changed, you know, plus a little bit of propagation delay. So um, as soon as we change the address bus, the changes, um, you know, after some propagation delay immediately reflected on the read bus. However, um, if we want to write, um, the write only occurs on the rising edge of the, uh, of the clock signal. And as we get into the design of our data memory, you're gonna see exactly why this is. Talking about the instruction memory now, I'll just clean this up a little bit. Talking about the instruction memory now, the, whoops, this should be a 16. So instruction memory uses 16-bit addressing as well, but rather than using 8-bit words, it uses 16-bit words. So each word in instruction memory is two bytes long, and the addressing that we use is um, word level addressing rather than byte level addressing. And that means the first 16-bit in instruction in instruction memory has address zero, the second 16-bit instruction in address memory has address one and, uh, and so on. And instruction memory is also implemented, we will um, assume using combinational logic. So as soon as you change the value on the address bus, the new value is immediately um, output on our 16-bit read bus minus some propagation time. So what we're going to do for the remainder of this lecture is design a simplified version of the AVR data memory. So the AVR data memory has 16-bit addressing and an 8-bit data bus. Um, what we're going to do instead is we're going to draw or design a data memory that uses 8-bit words, just like the AVR data memory, but uses 2-bit addressing rather than 16-bit addressing. And that means our total memory capacity is four bytes because um, we have one byte per word. And because we're only using two-bit addressing, we can only address four words. Okay, but the functional block of this memory is going to be exactly the same as kind of, you know, the real thing. Um, we're going to have an address bus, a write bus, a read bus, a write enable control line, and my lines aren't very straight, a clock input. So clock input, we will have a single bit write enable control line. So when write enable is one, then whatever is on the eight bit write bus is written into the location specified by the address bus. The read bus is also going to be eight bits and the address bus is only going to be two bits. So this just simplifies like the diagrams that we're going to be drawing, but hopefully you can see how what we're going to be doing in the coming slides can easily be scaled up to what is actually done inside the AVR. So the lowest level that we're going to look at memory is um, at the memory cell level. 
And for this class, a memory cell is a logic structure that stores a single bit. And this is something that you would have learned about in your intro to digital logic class. Um, so one example of a memory cell is a latch structure, and this is an SR latch. And typically latches involve some feedback. Um, you've got a you know, some sort of combinational logic and then the output is fed back to the input of another combinational logic gate. And if you look at the truth table for the SR latch, um, you know, you can set it one way to set Q equal to one. You've got another setting to set Q equal to zero. You've got another setting that will just latch whatever state you happen to be, um, you happen to have stored last. And then in this particular case, you've also got a setting that will cause the, the circuit to go unstable. Another memory example of a memory cell is the memory cell used for SR, um, sorry, for SDRAM, or for, sorry, for SRAM. So, <clears throat> SRAM is the type of RAM used within the AVR. And we're not going to get into this in a huge amount of detail. This class is not really a digital logic design class, but I, I still wanted to show this to you to show you that like at a fundamental level, if you if you know what a latch circuit is, you kind of know what um, static RAM is all about as well. So at the heart, static RAM stores a bit as a... Um, using a transistor structure that is essentially the functionally equivalent to a couple of cross-coupled um, inverters. You've got two transistors here that serve to connect or disconnect these cross-coupled transistors with the BL buses. You can think of this BL bus as the data bus that you use to read and write memory. And then this WL bus essentially enables whether or not a particular memory cell is connected to the, uh, the data bus or not. You'll notice that um, we have BL and then the, the complement, and that's because static RAM uses differential signaling. So rather than using a single uh, logic line to hold a one or a zero, it uses two differential lines, and that just improves the performance for, for very high speed applications. Basically, the way SRAM works is um, for reading, you just um, you set WL equal to one, that connects the cross coupled inverters to the data bus and then you can read the uh, read the data bus. For writing, you actually design this memory cell in such a way that whatever logic value is put on top of the data buses will overpower whatever um, value happens to be stored in your static RAM cell. So for example, if you wanted to have a value of one on BL and zero on you know, not BL, and let's say you had a value of zero and one stored within your um, within your memory cell, this one is going to overpower this zero. And they make this possible by um, adjusting the size of the transistors such that the um, the transistors driving the data bus can overpower the transistors, the smaller transistors used to implement these cross-coupled inverters. But these Transistors are still, you know, big enough to remember the value that uh, that you write to it. So, anyway, I'm, I'm not going to get into too much more detail than that. Again, this is a little bit lower the level than what you know this current class is all about. But I wanted to start here just to show that you know this latch structure, which you know is not really used a ton in actual digital memory, still allows you to understand the SRAM cell, which is used a lot in, in digital memory. And so we're, we're starting, you know, the technology today starts in a place that hopefully you can, you can understand. We are going to, the, the data memory that we're designing for the AVR is synchronous memory. That means that the writes 
to the um, reads are asynchronous, but the writing to the data memory is synchronous, as I described. And there is such a thing as synchronous um, SRAM, but its design is is pretty, um, you know, it's it's pretty involved to sort of really sort of understand how it's implemented. And so for the sake of kind of clarity, what we're going to do is we're going to sort of go back to a, a logic structure that you're familiar with, I'm sure, from, from your previous course, and that is the D flip-flop. So the D flip-flop structure is not exactly what's used to um, create modern um, synchronous SRAM, but you know it's close enough, certainly from a functional perspective, that we can use it to sort of go forward. So just be aware, you know, the this this D flip flop structure that we're using, I'm using it mainly just because it's convenient. It's a little easier to understand, a little easier to construct our design with. It's not exactly what's used, but functionally, it's it's close enough. And you know, this is going to be the block that I use for our basic D flip flop. And so the way it works is whatever value we have on the D input, on the rising edge of our clock signal will be latched by the D flip flop and will appear at the Q output. So this is a positive edge triggered D flip flop. If you want to dive inside the D flip flop, again, it's the D flip flop is built from, it can be built from three SR latches, which is what I've shown here. There's a couple of different designs for D flip flops. You know, we're not going to be doing much at the logic level in this class, but again, I just wanted to sort of show this to you just so we're starting from, you know, the place where probably you would have left off in your, in your digital logic design class. So now going forward, we're going to use all these tools that you developed in your previous course, and we're basically going to use them to build a computer. So the fundamental component that we're going to use to build our data memory is the D flip-flop. Specifically, we're going to use a positive edge triggered a positive edge triggered D flip-flop. And this is how we're going to draw our D flip-flop in a circuit. And we have two um, well, three, I guess, inputs and outputs to our block. We have our clock signal, we have our D input signal, and we have our Q output signal. And basically, the Q output is um, what stores the state that um, is contained inside our flip-flop. So, but very specifically, let's um, just do a little bit of a timing diagram, and this will be a review. So let's assume that um, you know our D input line is zero, then it goes up to one, oops, and then stays up at one. Now, what's going to happen with our D flip flop is that um, basically on the rising, because we have a positive edge triggered, we're assuming we, this is a positive edge triggered flip-flop. Basically what happens is the value on the D line is clocked into the flip-flop on the rising edge of our clock waveform and it's stored until the next rising edge of our clock waveform. And the stored value is what comes out of the Q output line. And so the D flip-flop, um, so, so for our first, um, so for our first rising edge, the value of D is zero. And up until this rising edge, Q would have been undefined. And I'll show you in another slide how I'd like you to sort of represent an undefined bit digital line. But if I um, just back up the queue, 
basically our digital line, if, if, we, if we don't know the value of our digital line, I'm gonna get you to draw something like this, sort of this, these X's that show that we're not really sure what the value of our, um, of our, of our digital line would be. But as soon as we have the, um, as soon as we hit our rising edge, and let me sort of clean the diagram up a little bit here, and I'll change my color. So as soon as we hit our rising edge, what's gonna happen is the flip-flop is going to clock in the value of whatever is on the D line, and that value is going to appear at our Q output. And so our um, Q output is gonna make the transition from the undefined state down to uh, the zero state, and it's gonna stay at zero. Now, we have another rising edge, and let me see if I can just copy this. Ooh, exactly. All right, there we go. So I'm just gonna copy this. Um, this line and use it to kind of mark where we have our rising edges. And so basically at the start of all of these gray um, vertical lines, that's where the state of the D flip-flop is gonna change and it's gonna change based on whatever the value of the D input line is. And so at this point, we uh, the D is still zero. And so the value for the Q input is going to remain zero. D changes at this point, but that change is not yet reflected in the Q output because the state on the D line is not clocked into the D flip-flop until we reach the next rising edge of the clock. And so once we get to that rising edge, then this is the point where Q rises to one. And then after that, the Q line stays, stays at one. So basically, um, you know, and again, this is review. I'm, I'm sure that this is all probably coming back to you, but, but the main thing is that the D flip-flop remembers whatever um, we give it on its input line, on its D line, um, and the state of the D flip-flop only changes on the rising edge of the, of the clock. So it turns out that in order to be useful for our data memory design, we have to add two enhancements to our, our basic positive edge triggered D flip-flop. And the first enhancement is to add something called an output enable. Now in general, it's a bad idea for a digital designer to connect a number of digital outputs together. So if you have, let's say an AND gate and maybe an OR gate, <laughs> and then maybe an exclusive OR gate, if you connected all of these outputs together, you could potentially run into problems because if this output was trying to, <clears throat> excuse me, if the AND gate was trying to output a one and the OR gate was trying to output a zero, the two outputs would basically fight. You would have one trying to pull the voltage high on the line and the other one's trying to ground it. And um, you would get um, kind of an indeterminate sort of intermediate kind of voltage level that would cause problems in your circuit. So you only ever want one output driving a digital bus at one time. However, there are cases where, you know, it might be nice for us to have all of these outputs connected because our digital design is careful enough that we would only ever want to uh, that we only ever care about one of these outputs at a time. So we want to know what the AND gate thinks, and we don't really care what the other gates think, 
Or maybe there's another situation where we want to know what the OR gate output is and we don't really care what the other outputs are. And so one way to allow the connection of several digital outputs to a common line is using something called a tri-state buffer. Now, a tri-state buffer is usually drawn like this. Um, it's just sort of that, that basic kind of triangular buffer shape. There's an input and an output and then a control line. So when a con the control line is equal to one, basically the input is equal to the output. This, this behaves exactly like a wire. However, when the control line is equal to zero, what happens is output goes into what we call a high impedance state. And you can basically, like conceptually, you, this is basically electrically equivalent to having a little switch in here. And when the control uh, line is equal to zero, the switch is open, right? So we, we essentially disconnect the output from the input when control is equal to zero. And when the control line is equal to one, the switch closes. And so having this kind of, you know, connect, disconnect sort of functionality allows us to have multiple gates connected to the same digital line. So if we go back to our original example and uh, where we have an AND gate and an OR gate connected to the same output, what we would do is we would have a tri-state buffer in between the individual gate outputs and then the common connection point. And so when we wanted to uh, determine the output of the AND gate, we would set the control, late, uh, the control line on the top tri-state buffer to one, the control line on the bottom tri-state buffer to zero. We would essentially have a closed switch in the top and an open switch in the bottom. And so this output would only be driven by the AND gate. If we wanted to reverse it and get the um, see what the output of the OR gate was, we would set this to zero, the bottom control line to one, the bottom control switch would close, the top control switch would open, and uh, then our output would be just driven by the, by the OR gate. And as it turns out, this is going to be important for our memory design because we're going to have a bunch of different memory elements, let's call them for elements for now, connected to a common output bus. And the addressing is basically going to enable one of those elements and disable all the other ones. And the only way to have them all connected to the output bus together is for them to all have these tri-state buffers. And so how we implement that is we basically add a tri-state buffer to our original edge triggered flip-flop design. So we have our original flip-flop, we add a tri-state buffer, we call the, um, the control line on the tri-state buffer OE, which is short for output enable, and we're now gonna draw our new and improved flip-flop using this um, digital diagram. So it behaves exactly like a regular flip-flop. It clocks in the D state uh, or the, the value of the D line on the rising edge of the clocks. However, if output enable is um, is one, then this Q output behaves as normal. But if the output is, if OE is zero, then the little switch in this tri-state buffer opens up and the Q line is in this high impedance state. The second enhancement for our flip-flop is what uh, we're going to call the right enable line. And basically, the state of the flip-flop is going to be updated on a rising clock edge only when right enable is equal to one. When right enable is equal to zero, the state of the flip-flop doesn't change. So you can think of this as kind of like, you know, um, when, it, when right enable is equal to one, we update the state of our device. When it's equal to zero, the state of that device is sort of frozen or stored, no matter what's happening with the clock or what's happening with our input lines. And so the easy, an easy way to implement write enable is to just and the clock 
with our write enable line. And so when we, if we look at the, um, you know, the truth table for our AND gate, when write enable is equal to one, and clock is zero, we have zero. When clock is one, we have one, right? So when write enable is equal to one, the clock behaves as normal. But when write enable is equal to zero, it doesn't matter what the clock is, the output is equal to zero. So when write enable is equal to zero, we just basically zero our clock and we have no rising edges. And if we have no rising edges, the state of our D flip-flop is not gonna change. So um, our output enabled D flip-flop then, its clock input is not the clock signal, it's the output of the AND of the clock signal and WE. And then we, rec rec or we, <laughs> we take this whole structure and we represent it as this element, which is kind of our, our new and improved D flip-flop it works exactly like a regular positive edge trigger D flip-flop, except we have these two features, two additional features. We have this high impedance output enable, and we have this right enable line such that um, the state of the flip-flop is only updated on the rising clock edge if WE is equal to one. So, and this, um, I, I mentioned this on an earlier slide, but you know, there will sometimes be uh, conditions where we're uncertain about the state of our D flip-flop. And this usually happens after we first power up the device and we haven't yet had a rising edge to clock any kind of state into the D flip-flop. So we're not sure really what the, um, what the state of the D flip-flop is. So if we had to draw the Q output line, then we would just use this kind of cross hatching between zero and one to represent the fact that we don't know uh, what our state is. And if on a rising clock edge, we make the transition to a one, then we show just a rising edge to one. And if on the rising clock edge, we know that we're making a transition to zero, then the, our cross hatch pattern ends with a falling edge to, to zero. So now we're basically ready to use our sort of enhanced D flip-flops to make our very first memory element. And the very first memory element we're gonna create is something called a register. And a register basically stores the state of a number of parallel inputs for one clock cycle and makes those inputs available on the same number of outputs. So essentially what we're doing is we're hooking up a whole bunch of D flip-flops in parallel is how we're building this thing. And so for the purpose of our little sort of memory design that we're, we're starting with, remember that we are storing 8-bit words. That's, um, so the, the word length in our, um, our memory is, is 8 bits. So it makes sense that we would need some kind of structure that's able to store eight bits that can be updated in, in some way. And so what we've done is we've taken our, our D flip-flop and we've hooked up a bunch of them in parallel. And the clock, a common clock is fed into all of them. The right enable a common write enable is fed into all of them and a common output enable line is fed into all of them as well. So all of these D flip flops will uh, be updated at the same time if write enable is equal to one. All of these D flip flops will either be providing us with an output or a high impedance state depending on the OE input. Because we have eight of them hooked up in parallel, we have eight parallel inputs and eight parallel outputs. And so we can take this structure and represent it as something that looks 
actually a lot like our D flip-flop drawing. This looks essentially identical to our D flip-flop drawing, except the only difference is that the input line, rather than being a single digital line, is now an 8-bit bus, an 8-bit parallel bus. And the output digital line is also an 8-bit parallel bus. But otherwise, this basically works exactly like the D flip-flop did, except now we're working with eight bits in parallel rather than just one bit at a time. So, um, for example, if we have, you know, the eight bit number zero X um, 22 loaded in, so that would be zero, zero, one, zero, 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 one, zero the value on of d7 would be zero because that's this most significant bit the value of d1 would be one and the value of d0 would be zero and so these values appear on the inputs to our individual d flip-flops and if right enable is equal to one then on the rising edge of our clock all of these parallel inputs are locked or shifted into um, the state of our D flip-flops. And then 0x22 appears on the output of our register as well, because our outputs represent the state of our D flip-flops, as long as output enable is equal to one. If output enable is equal to zero, then this, output 22 goes away and when we end up getting a high impedance output which we sometimes denote as high z because z often represents impedance so anyway like it's um you know so now we're, we're storing a, a word we're storing an 8-bit word with this register structure but hopefully you can see that it's basically the same functionality as our original d flip-flop so if you'll recall our sort of scaled down memory that we're trying to design here has two address lines, which means we can store four 8-bit words in our memory. And on the previous slide, we developed uh, this register structure that can basically store a single 8-bit word. And so the way that we're going to design our memory then is you know we we have a structure that can store a single word and we need to store four of them in our memory so we're basically going to accomplish this with four registers so we're basically going to have four of these 8-bit registers inside our memory and that's going to store our four bytes however we will want to be able to just access one of those registers at a time and we do that by putting different values on our address bus. And so you can kind of imagine we've got these four structures inside our memory, but we only want to access one of them at a time based on the value of our address input. And so the digital device or digital structure that we're going to use to basically select one of these registers and deselect the other ones that we're not interested in is a decoder. And a decoder is something that you may have seen in your uh, sort of basic digital logic class. But basically, it's a device that takes two inputs and uses the combination of the, in or sorry, it's a device that takes um, a, a certain number of inputs, not necessarily two, but we have two in, our, in this example. It's a device that takes these two inputs and then uses the value of those inputs to enable one out one of several output lines. Okay, so that wasn't, <laughs> I didn't say that very well, but let's do the example, it'll be more clear. So we have two digital inputs, A1 and A0. And so that means we have four possible values. And we have four output lines, Y0 through Y3. And basically each unique combination of inputs is going to enable just one of these four different output lines. So if we have 0, 0 on our input, we enable 
our first line, so our first line is equal to one and all the other ones are equal to zero. If we have zero, one on our input, the second line is equal to one and all the other ones are equal to zero. This enables the third line, this enables the fourth line. So a decoder promises to only ever have one of its output lines high at a time and the output line that is high or equal to one is dependent on the value of these input lines. And so using our decoder and using our registers, this is how we're going to design our data memory. So this is our complete data memory design. And um, just to highlight a few things, here's our decoder. And these are the four 8-bit registers that I mentioned. Okay, so each one of these four registers is going to store a different 8-bit word in our 4-bit, or sorry, our 4-byte uh, data memory. So let's take a moment to take a look at the how the digital lines run through through this design. So first of all, we can see that our outputs are all connected together, right? So we're all connected to a common 8-bit bus and we label this 8-bit bus RD. So this is our read bus. So this is where we read our value of memory that we're addressing. And remember, normally connecting a bunch of digital outputs to the same wire or the same bus is a terrible idea, but we have enhanced our D flip-flops and our registers to have these tri-state outputs. And so, and these tri-state outputs are connected to our decoder. So if we put 00, zero into our decoder, this output line is going to be equal to one and all of the other output lines are gonna be equal to zero. So the output of this first register that I've just circled are going to show up on the RD bus. And because this line is zero, the second register goes into high impedance state or basically disconnects itself from the bus. Because this register is zero, or sorry, because that digital line is zero, this this register that I've just circled um, disconnects itself from the bus. And because the fourth line is equal to zero, this fourth register disconnects itself from the bus as well. Now, because we're using a decoder, a decoder promises to only ever have one of its outputs equal to one at any particular time. So this guarantees that only one register will ever be sort of switched on or connected to our output bus and all the other ones will be disconnected. And the one that happens to be connected to the output is based on the value of the address line input. And so we can see that this implements our sort of read addressing functionality. So we, we put the address or the index of the register we wanna read on our A bus and it selects the appropriate register and the output of that register appears on RD. So let me <laughs> clean up this diagram now because it's very messy. One other thing I wanted to point out is that we mentioned that the read functionality in our memory is basically, uh, is essentially based on combinational logic. And we can see now that this is true. So our decoder is combinational logic. As soon as the value of A changes, the value of whatever output is equal to one is gonna change. As soon as these output enables change state, they are immediately going to put whatever, um, whichever register is connected will immediately place its state on the read bus. And so none of this sort of selecting of the registers and the data showing up on the read bus has anything to do with the clock. So the clock is completely not an issue when we're reading from our data memory. That changes, however, when we want to write to our data memory. So when we're writing to our data memory, we set 
our we input equal to zero. However, you'll notice that we've added a layer of logic here because while we want to have just a single we input for our memory, right? We just want to have one line to tell the memory, okay, we're gonna to write to you now. We still need to be able to figure out which of these registers that we're going to write to because when we put a, a value on our WD input bus, we don't want that value to be copied into all of the registers. We only want the value to be copied into the register that we've selected with our address lines. And so we're actually going to reuse the decoder for the write operation as well. And so to be specific about that, let's say we have zero one on our address line. That means that this li first line is gonna be equal to zero, the second line is one, the third line is zero, and the fourth line is zero. And so if we follow the output of this decoder, it will enable the output of the register for the read operation, and that's fine. However, the output also goes up to here. And we can see that the master read enable input that we have at the interface to our data memory actually goes through an AND gate with the decoder that selects our particular register. And so a register is only going to be written to if the master WE input is equal to one. So when we set this input equal to one, we're going to have a one here, 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 and here but we only want the register that we've selected with our address to be written to. And so the WE master is then ANDed with the decoder output. And that means only the register that has its decoder output high will actually have a one at the WE input for its particular register block. Because this line is equal to zero, this input is gonna be equal to zero because this line is equal to zero, that one's equal to zero and so on. And so when we look at our data memory structure, we have the ability to write, not to not only use the address for reading, but also to use the address for writing. And so once um, we have set our address, once we is equal to one, and once um, you know the, the AND gate puts we equal to one on our register, at that point, and only after all that has happened, can the clock signal then read in whatever value is on the WD bus, and that value is stored in this register. You'll notice that the WD input is fed into all the other registers as well, but because they all have zeros on their write enables, they're gonna basically ignore that input. And so this hopefully, and then we can kind of take all of this stuff, bundle it together and put it into a single data memory block. Now, hopefully you can see how this sort of simple memory design can be scaled up to implement the actual AVR data memory, right? So, so this functional block is exactly the same as the AVR data memory block that we looked at at the start of the lecture. We have already an 8-bit data bus. And the only difference is, you know, we only have two a 2-bit address bus and the actual AVR memory is, is 16 bits. But then hopefully you can see how we would scale this design up, right? Um, if we have more addresses if we want to if we have more addresses we need to be able to store more bytes which means that rather than just having four of these structures we would need two to the 16 of them and we would need a larger decoder such that we take a 16-bit input and then we have two to the 16 different selector lines at the output. So now we're ready to design something called the program counter in our microarchitecture. And you'll remember back when we first introduced 
microarchitectures and machine language, we basically said that the normal sort of operation for uh, most microarchitectures is to basically sequentially execute the machine language instructions stored in instruction memory. So we um, we execute the first one, then the second one, then the third one, and, and so on. As we're going to see later on, this isn't always true. So when we start to talk about if statements, loops, function calls, um, we'll, we will see that we are going to jump around a little bit in, in instruction memory, but most of the time we just execute um, sequential instructions. And the purpose of the program counter is basically to allow us to do that. So the program counter is a 16-bit register that holds the address of the instruction that we're currently executing. And so in this slide, we have our instruction memory and we have a 16-bit register. Write enable is hardwired to one, output enable is hardwired to one, and we have our CPU clock feeding in the, uh, in the clock. Um, connected to the, the clock input of the register. Now, when we reset our CPU, the contents of this register are initialized to zero. And so that means when we start our computer um, for the very first time, the value at the output of this register on this 16-bit bus is 0x0000. Zero 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 zero. That indexes the first machine language instruction in our instruction memory. And so on the read bus, we have our first machine language instruction coming out. Now, sequential execution is made possible by this extra digital hardware we add below the register. So our 16-bit um, all zero value is also fed into an adder block that just adds one to our um, to the other input. And so the value at the output of the adder is 0x0001. And that is fed back into the, um, the input of our register. Now the register doesn't change until the rising edge of our clock signal. When we hit the we get the rising edge of our clock, the value 0001 is shifted into the register. Um, it's reflected on our address bus. And then the output of our instruction memory changes to the second machine language instruction. 0001 feeds into our adder. And then the output of our adder becomes 0002. And that value is waiting at the input to our um, program counter register for the next rising clock edge. And so at the next rising clock edge, the address changes to two, then we execute the third machine language instruction and so on. So basically the program counter design allows us to execute a new machine language instruction or read out a new machine language instruction on the rising edge of every single one of our CPU clocks. And just to, to draw that um, out maybe a little bit more, if this is our, our CPU clock and this is our address, we would start with um, 0x001 and then at our rising edge, we would change this to, whoops, sorry, zero, zero. Um, at our next rising clock edge, this would change to um, zero x, zero, zero, one, and, and so on. Um, my, my diagram's a little bit crowded here, but I, I think you can probably see what I'm saying. So now I wanna finish off this lecture by, again, stepping back a little bit further and talking about our overall microarchitecture design. Now that we know how data memory is designed, and now that we've created these, this functional data memory block, we can add some more detail to our microarchitecture. Before, you know, I just had like sort of a big block labeled memory. Now we're gonna be able to add a little bit more detail in terms of data buses and control lines. And we're gonna see that our microarchitecture design is essentially divided into two pieces, or we will divide it into two pieces.
The first piece is the data path. And this is the digital logic and the connections responsible for handling um, user data. Basically, the machine language instructions that the user wants to run on the computer and all the data that results from um, those particular instructions. Sort of above or in parallel with the data path is something we're going to call the control path. And the control path, again, consists of a series of connections and digital logic that are responsible for controlling the different functional blocks that handle the user data, the, the instructions and, the, um, and the, the, the data variables and stuff like that that, um, that result from those, uh, those calculations and those instructions. And so we're going to primarily be focusing on the digital logic design for the data path that's going to develop over the coming lectures. And I'm not going to present a detailed design for the control path. However, I will highlight the control lines that would be under the, um, that the control path would be responsible for managing. And we will talk just sort of in general about how you would design, um, design the control path. And so, this is basically the evolved diagram of our microarchitecture. So if you remember, we used to just have one block for instruction memory, one block for data memory, and then we had a processor, and then I just drew like, you know, a double-sided arrow to show communication between the two. Now we have a lot more detail. So this instruction memory block is basically encompassed by this part of the picture. So we now understand that instruction memory consists of a read-only instruction memory block implemented most likely in Flash or Flash for the AVR case. We have a 16-bit address bus a 16-bit read bus that contains our 16-bit machine language instructions. And we've added the program counter, which is a digital logic framework that allows us to sequentially read um, machine language instructions from instruction memory. We now also, rather than just sort of drawing a generic data memory block and an arrow, you know, interacting with the processor, we now can specify a lot more detail for our data memory as well. We have a 16-bit address bus, an 8-bit bus for writing to the data memory, an 8-bit bus for reading from the data memory. 16-bit. And we also have our first control line. Write enable is set by the control path. So you can think of the control path as existing sort of above our data path. And the control path is responsible for taking a look at the machine language instruction that we are trying to execute and then setting the control lines of the data path appropriately to execute that instruction. So if we were writing to data memory, we, the control path would take a look at our machine language instruction, say, oh, this particular instruction needs to write to data memory and then it would set the write enable line to one. If it was an instruction that did not need to write to data memory, then it would set this control line to zero. And we're gonna see as we add more detail to our microarchitecture, we're gonna have more and more control lines that would need, need, that would need to be managed by the, uh, the control path. But hopefully, so we're, we're not very far into it, but hopefully you can already see this, um, you know, this design kind of evolving, and we're just going to keep on adding more and more detail as we um, dive into each one of these blocks.